Ladies and gentlemen, all the way from Belfast, Northern Ireland. He normally hey. speaks at academic conferences where everybody has long beards and very kind of reserved sort of temperaments, but he's here in Grand Rapids, Michigan, with a contingent from Australia. We got a little Argentina. We got a little all over the place. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my friend, Peter Rollins. Oh, shut, stop us, stop us. <laughs> I mean, you Americans are too nice. This is what, honestly, they, they try to get rid of me in Ireland. Um, you guys actually listen to what I have to say. Which is lovely. Although you mock me with your perfect white teeth. Every time you smile, I know you're mocking me. Right now, you're mocking me. Uh, and honestly, you are really nice. Um, even if you don't like me, you tell me that you do. Whereas back home, even if we like you, we tell you that we don't. You know? um, and although the fireworks display for me when I arrived on Saturday night was... <laughs> That's too much, guys, you know, I mean, honestly, you know, it was, it was, it was beautiful, like, but it was a little bit much. Home of the free. Yeah, yeah. Land of the brave. Absolutely. <laughs> also, you're also very, uh, a lot more energetic and um, excited and confident than we are in Ireland, because last time I was on tour, I saw this pizza shop which said, best pizzas in the world, and I thought, you imagine the amount of research you'd have to do to discover <laughs> if you had the, the be I mean, that, I mean, that guy's phenomenal. In, in Ireland, it would say, our pizzas are pretty rubbish, but <laughs> you're standing outside anyway, and it's probably raining, you know? So, uh, yeah, it's, it's nice to be around places, that, you know, this confidence and this, this goodness, but yeah, please be nasty to me, because all of this being nice is too much. I, I was in a, one last thing. Sorry. You know, I'm just thinking. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah. Like, just go. No, let's you. Go. Yeah. Just oh, go. Let's go. I don't. Yeah. I don't. I, I was honestly, I was in this restaurant yesterday. That's what happened. And I was ordering, <laughs> and I ordered crab cakes. And he said, "Oh man, that's a great choice. That just causes anxiety in me because I'm going like, <laughs> is there a right choice to make? <laughs> so now every time I go to a restaurant here, I'm kind of like." What's the right thing to choose? Obviously, like, there's, there's one thing that I get the affirmation. Oh, man, that was a great choice. So, I don't know, really. But anyway, hi. Yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Rollins. Hey, uh, thank you. <laughs> is that us done? You know that everybody now, when they meet you, is going to, like, smile really big. Oh, yeah, don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, Peter's first book was called How Not to Speak of God. And I read it a while ago and I had this, like, I, oh man, I would love to have a meal with him. So I found somebody who knew somebody who said they might have an email. And I emailed and said, uh, Dear Peter, my name is Rob. I'm a pastor in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And could I like buy you lunch sometime? And he said, yes. And I was like, great. Now all I have to do is go to Belfast. So <laughs> I went there and got off the train station. And um, we found... I, I knew who you were because of the c picture on your book, and we just started talking and ended up, I think we talked for two days straight. Yeah. Um, it was just r really By great. the way, I told everybody about this, it's like, hi Pete, how are you? Rob Bell's coming to visit me to chat, you know? <laughs> so it's like, uh, all my friends knew that you were, you were on your way, you know? Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's a big deal. I don't, not every day I get a, an email from Rob Bell, can I come over to Belfast? I was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. so, um, <laughs> just crank, it'll come. Um, so, so in our, in talking, just there were all of these things where I was like, oh my word, the things that he is thinking in our conversation, there is so much here about, um, the sermon and communication and, and church, you name it, but there's a couple specific things that, that when we were putting this together, I thought if Peter would be around it would be just great. So um, maybe the first thing, um, Pete and his friends, who I got to have a meal with a bunch of the Icon folks, have a thing they do on Sunday nights once a month called Icon. And um, it's not, they don't, they don't, it doesn't have any sort of church label or anything. It's something else. And sometimes I think when you see something, um, sometimes I feel like you're seeing something that the implications of it, only later people are going to be able to unpack. Um, and sometimes what happens in... in is you see something and you don't quite know what to call it, but you know that within it, it has seeds of something that are gonna grow and someday we're all gonna be talking about that. Does that make sense? You, you, and so um, one of the things I want Pete to do is just tell us a bit about, an, uh, there isn't, really isn't a typical or average icon Sunday night, but give us a couple examples of things you all have done just to give them a kind of a tangible sense of what you guys do. Absolutely, and I love what you say about, um, you know, 
You do, sometimes you don't know what you're doing at the time. You look back from the future and you see that maybe what you were doing was significant. At the time, you don't have a clue what you're up to. Um, Kierkegaard said, life is lived forwards and understood backwards. Uh, often in conferences and in churches, people say, uh, fulfill your dreams, as if that's the best thing you can do. You know, Fulfill your dreams. You can fulfill your dreams. But sometimes um, there's a more radical challenge because the problem is, our dreams are reified, um, idealized versions of our present understanding. Um, in other words, a fairy tales tell you something about the society out of which they arose. In Western society, poor people become wealthy, powerless people become powerful. In, West, in the Eastern kind of society, uh, powerful people become powerless, wealthy people bec um, give their possessions away. So these, these fairy tales tell you something about the values of your society, and fairy tales are a way of passing those values, values and, um, onto the next generation. So sometimes the most challenging thing is not to fulfill your dreams, but to place yourself in a position where you can dream new ones. And, and that means stepping out of everything you know and trying to do something utterly different, allowing something new to take place. So that's kind of how I started Icon in this pub. Uh, I was drinking there, and I was with my French tutor at the time. I didn't learn much French, but we were out having a drink, and, and uh, I, I told her, I'd love to do something, and she said, what, would it, what is it? I, go, I have no idea, no idea, but I'd love to do it in this pub. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, this is true. This is true, so I'm supping on this Guinness, and she goes, well, why don't you ask? No interest in religion, she was typical, you know, French, you know. And, but she said, oh, why, why don't you ask Francie? My Francie is he's as tall as you, you know, standing up behind the bar. So I go to him, Francie, I'd love to do something in your pub. And he goes, what is it? You might want to sit down for this one. Um, and he said, no, 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 what is it? So I said, well, I don't really know what I want to do, but it's something to do with spirituality and faith and it'll involve probably poetry and a bit of music and ritual and whatever. And he looked at me for what felt like a day, you know, 30 seconds probably, but, and then he wrote me in the book and says, you're on in three weeks. And that's how Icon began. So what does Icon look like? That's the question. You gotta keep me right here, because I'll just waffle, you know? No. All over the place, no. <laughs> so Icon, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you various things that we do. Um, in Icon, uh, we have these groups that meet around the monthly gathering, which is the Transformance Art Gathering. We have a group called uh, and the non-membership course. Now, the non-membership course is very important because an icon, if you ever ask, are you a member, they'll say no. Oh, I just go from time to time. You know, oh, I'm not a member of icon, absolutely not. So if you do the non-membership card, you get a, a course, you get a card that says you're not a member. So if anybody ever asks you, you know, are you a member of icon, you've got evidence that you're not, that you just, that you just go from time to time. Um, and, yeah. And, and that's very key, because in one sense, we could never be a cult, because nobody would ever follow anybody. The, the, what we're trying to do is, is get people to think for themselves, take responsibility for their own beliefs and their own ideas. So that's very central to, to some, some of the values that we have. In fact, I mean, for me, that's the role of a, a Christian leader. The role of a Christian leader is to refuse to lead. Um, and, and what do I mean by that? Now, by the way, that's a vital role. That doesn't mean you can just go away and do nothing. No, no, someone has to refuse to lead. There has to be someone who takes no responsibility, okay, right? Um, you need, yeah, and I'm a big advocate of this. There, all, there has to be someone who says it's not my fault. So the, the, if you think about analysis, right, you've got an analyst and you've got an analyzand, the person being analyzed, and people often think that the role of the analyst is to tell you what the problem is, to assess your behavior, to tell you what the, how can I be healed, how, what can I do? But of course, the real role of the analyst is to refuse to be an analyst, to push back so that you come to that place for yourself, so that you find the answer. So ironically, you need an analyst who refuses to be an analyst. You need someone who refuses to do it. So every time, because there's a tendency, that's what Le Jacques Lacan, a French theorist said, said, what do we want? We want a leader we can dominate. You know, that's what I want. I want someone at the front of church, I want Rob Bell to say exactly uh, what I want him to say. And then if it doesn't work, I can blame him. Don't have to blame him. You said that if I prayed for my child, my child would be better, and it didn't happen. Therefore, mm. I'm leaving this church. Whatever mm. it is, they're, they're, they're making you take responsibility for them rather than taking responsibility for yourself. So leaders who refuse to lead are the ones who are always trying to push back. We also have a, a group called the Last Supper, 
where 12 of us meet over food and wine in an upper room, and we invite a guest, uh, someone of public influence, to come and talk about what they believe and why they believe it. And if we don't like what they say, it's their last supper, hence it's called <laughs> The Last Supper. Um, and uh, we, uh, we, have a, we have a group called the Omega Course. Now, this might not make sense in America. There's a big course called the Alpha Course in the UK, which is like a 12-week course on how to get into Christianity. So the Omega Course is a 12-week course on how to exit Christianity. Um, because we kind of feel that there's probably some fundamental problem, actually, with what's called the actually existing church. And so this is a 12-week course on exit. And you wouldn't believe how many people want to exit Christianity. It's a, like, we've got pastors doing it, worship leaders. We've got people who go to church every week to people who aren't. And really, it's about exiting toxic religion. But it's about kind of being a place where we can ask any questions whatsoever, and no one will give you any hassle or any problems, you know. Um, yeah, oh that's, oh, that's key, oh, I can't talk about it. Oh, the um, ev evangelism team. The eva oh yeah, was, can I talk about that? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, we've got a group called the evangelism team. Um, I wasn't gonna mention this. Yeah, it's a group who go out to be evangelized. So we, we go <laughs> and we, we ask people to evangelize us. We go to various religious groups and various things like that to be, to be evangelized. Um, now there's a whole pile of reasons why we do that. Can't get into them all now. But uh, in a sense, I know. One of the greatest philosophers is, of course, Winnie the Pooh, right? And Winnie the Pooh, um, in the very first book, there's that beautiful verse, you know, um, here is Winnie the Pooh coming downstairs now, bump, bump, bump on the back of his head behind Christopher Robin. Uh, sometimes he wonders if perhaps there is a different way of coming downstairs, if only he could stop bumping long enough to think of it. And you have this beautiful image of Winnie the Pooh bumping his head down these stairs, right? That's kind of what we're all like. We're all bumping our heads down this cosmic staircase, wondering if perhaps there's a better way of doing it. And when you expose that, when you, when you do powerless evangelism, what happens is, right, if I come in and say, I believe in God because of X, Y, and Z, this person says, I don't believe in God because of X, Y, and Z, and you're like this. And then if you go, actually, I don't know, it might have been a cheese I ate last night, you know. Um, I, I, maybe, maybe it's because I'm afraid of death or whatever it is. I don't know. Half the time I think what I believe is rubbish. Well, what happens? Does the other person laugh? Sometimes they do, yeah. But, but most of the time, no. That allows the person to go, well, sometimes I wonder if there is more to life. Sometimes I wonder. And suddenly, your powerlessness, your ability to open up and listen to someone else creates this, this beautiful space. Right. And we've also got atheism for Lent, which is where for, for our Lenten readings, kind of go, what should we give up for Lent? So we go, well, why don't we give up God? Yeah, there you go. Um, and, <laughs> And we, we read uh, Nietzsche, Freud, Marx, Feuerbach, and we read these great critiques of Christianity, not to judge them, but to let them judge us. So it's this Lenten reading where we listen to the best of the critiques of, of our church and our culture and Christianity to listen and learn and be transformed and be changed by them. Um, but then there's the main gathering, and I'll just say a few things about that. We've got five coordinates. Icon is iconic, apocalyptic, heretical, emerging, and failing. And, and each of these What's kind What's the of, last one? Uh, feeling. 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 Okay. No, feeling. It's the feeling. accent. Feeling to feel. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, nobody, they don't understand a word I'm saying, do they? No. They're they... just nodding. <laughs> yeah. Um, now you so, know how I feel. Yeah, that's... <laughs> I know. Uh, you get two talks for the price of one when I'm speaking. I talk so fast, so there you go. Um, uh, what was I saying? Yes, oh yes, if I go, so what, an, an icon, you, you, you go in, and it's not a back room of a bar or anything like that, which is just, the, it's the bar, it's while people are drinking, and most people are there for icon, there's sometimes heckling and all of that, and uh, we, we engage in what we call transformance art. And transformance art is designed to facilitate a rupture, um, a provocation, a transformation in, in all who participate. Um, can I start talking about that stuff, actually? I, or should I say what an icon uh, looks like? Tell them that um, the apocalyptic night. Oh, yeah, Just give an idea of what happened oh, that yeah. night. Well, I mean, well, there's an example. There, every icon's different, but we did one on the second coming, um, and we're always running late. It's always a bit crazy. So we're, we had everybody waiting outside while we were kind of setting up. We did this in America, by the way. And we were setting up. We had a very well-known musician coming along to take part and a well-known speaker. And... Uh, we, had, we, we went outside and said, listen, we're, we're just setting up. We're waiting for someone to arrive. We'll be starting in five minutes. So everyone was waiting, you know. And eventually we opened the doors up and people came in and they sat down. We had to say, we're still setting up. We're still waiting for someone here, but we'll start in, in 10 minutes. There's some visuals going, some DJs playing, you know. Then after another five minutes, the musician gets up and does a sound check. 
and then sits back down. And we get up and we say, oh, listen, really sorry, we're still waiting for someone. We'll be starting in five minutes here. We'll be starting soon. And someone puts their hand up and says, well, while we're waiting, can I tell a story? Say, yeah, fair enough. So they come up and they tell a story of how the Messiah returns. And uh, some disciples recognize the Messiah, run up and fall at his feet, weeping. And then one of them looks up to the Messiah and says, I have waited all my life for you to arrive. I've waited all my life for you to come. I have one question that I've always wanted to ask you. And the Messiah says, what's your question? And so the disciple says, tell me, Messiah, when will you come? When will you come? Um, and I'll, I'll explain what that means tomorrow. But, and then some, somebody else got up and they said, oh, can, while we're waiting, can I tell a story? And they told a story about waiting as well. By the way, you know, your beloved in their presence is always to come. Um, every person is like the TARDIS in Doctor Who. Have you, I know, Dad, Doctor Who, you don't get that here, really. Uh, well, some of you do. Some of you do. The, basically, Doctor Who is this guy who travels around uh, through space and time in a telephone box. Yeah, a little bit weird. And the, the thing about the telephone box is it's tiny, but when you open up the doors, it just goes on forever, infinitely huge, right? So on the outside, it's just this little box, and the inside is infinitely huge, which is a wonderful, wonderful analogy, is it not? of human subjectivity. This fragile, freshly framed, this small, fragile frame that I am opens up to an inner world of infinite proportions. Every person is a universe. And when the person arrives, they arrive as that which is still to come, the not yet in the now, which is what eschatology means. Not the, the incoming of something that's in the future, the incoming in the future into the now. Um, so where was I? Uh, oh yeah, so then, then we say, oh, we're, we're still waiting for someone to arrive, really, really sorry. And of course, people start to pick up on the fact that the gathering not happening is the gathering. We're still waiting for someone to arrive, and it's about the second coming. You're still waiting for someone to arrive, they still haven't arrived. And so we did the whole gathering, all 45 minutes, where, and the musician said, it's the, first, it's the first gig I've ever played where the person asked me not to do anything, you know? The sound check was my gig. Um, and the speaker were like, they're just sitting there going, so I don't have to say anything. Um, and, uh, you know, so in other words, you're trying to get people to experience something. You know? So another one we did was called the God Delusion. We did this in a festival. You walk in, we had this 18-foot woman standing in the middle of people. They're very hard to find. Um, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, she was actually, she was, she was on um, step ladders, and, and we created this woolen dress that stretched right down to the ground. And then we had these pieces of wool stretching across the auditorium to people who were knitting new clothes out of the unraveling of this great piece of clothing, and we all wore unraveling clothing. So as you walked in, you all of this, and some of the unraveled clothing, we did this in the bar as well, was going over to people knitting new clothes. We had the Apostles' Creed on the screens, and people could go up, and they could write in what they wanted to put in, and they could take out what they wanted to take out throughout the gathering. And it was on track change, so you could see all the changes people were making, you know? Oh, if I, had two, if I have two coats, um, I believe that I should give one away putting that in her, you know, and, and engaging critically with the tradition, some people being angry with it, some people loving it, some people deleting the deletions, re-editing the re-edits, all of this kind of going on. And, uh, oh yeah, oh yeah, we're, 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 fundamentalism, I'll tell you this last one and then, and then I'll, I'll, we'll move on. Uh, fundamentalism, we did a festival and there are actually protesters outside with signs and people handing out tracts against what we were doing, you know, I, I mean, icon is heretical, which ironically, we are, and, and uh, 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 I, you know, you know, you know, you're, it won't be so cool when you're burning in the hell type stuff, you know. And so as, as people, as people were queuing, they were being confronted with this shouting and scream. Even the festival organisers had to, were saying, "We're going to have to call the police and get rid of these guys. This is really, really bad. We're about to start this gathering, and these guys are so disruptive." But of course, they were our guys, right? We'd, so, so. Um, uh, uh, but, and, and some people wanted to join them as well. Some, some people went, oh yeah, can we join? Because Icon are really dodgy. So they, they joined in the ironic protest. Like, and, uh, uh, so we, 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 we said to the organizers, yeah, call the police, get rid of those guys. I don't know who they are. You know? um, and the point being, so as soon as you walk in, before you're even in the room, you're experiencing something of what the gathering's about. And then when you enter the room, there are, there are pages of the Bible strewn up like, like rocks lying everywhere. There's on one screen people putting stuff into a Bible, someone writing stuff into a Bible. On another screen, somebody taking stuff out of a Bible. 
And then during the gathering, a variety of things happened. The ritual that night was we wrote our beliefs on rice paper and we passed them around for others to consume. We had this girl stood up and she didn't say anything like she was nervous in front of so many people and for about two minutes didn't say anything and then stood back down off a soapbox and it said women should remain silent in church came up on the big screen. Then this other woman got up and she gave this beautiful three minute sermon called the singing ministry of Christ, absolutely stunning. And when she finished, we heard the words said again, but they actually were the words of Ian Paisley. Ian Paisley is like this fundamentalist preacher, like you're Pat Robinson or something. So it would be the equivalent of Jerry Falwell. I don't know who he ever, his words. And so this person who's a fundamentalist who everybody hates, you realize, oh, it was his sermon. And she was just echoing his words. And this image comes up. I'm very sincere. And now you'll ask me, what does it mean? I have no idea what it means. <laughs> no idea what it means. You know? And that's the, that's the issue. People think a revelation is revealing. You know, wh- wh- God whispering in your ear or something. Now, oh, do you want to ask any more questions? <laughs> no. No, no. Just keep going. Okay. So, um, uh, yeah, like, like, you know, revelation is, a, is, a, is telling you something. Um, now, that's like, you know, the, the, the French soldiers, the French are lovers, not fighters, right? So that during the Second World War, it, said, it was said that the... Um, the French soldiers were at the front line, and one of the sergeants said, right lads over the top, and nobody moved. He said, right lads over the top, and nobody moves. Says it for a third time, and then the French loving the opera, you know, one of the French guys turns around to the other and says, oh, what a wonderful voice he has. What a wonderful voice, right? Was, you could hear, you could hear what he was saying, but not heed it, not do it. You can hear, but not do. And the problem with preaching today, for me, one of the fundamental problems is that we're trying to, we talk, we're trying to convince people's minds. We're trying to get people to, con, to uh, uh, affirm certain ideas and ideals. And what happens? We create an ironic church. Now, this is central, so I I'll really, I'll really want to go for this, right? Irony, what is irony? There's that story about the uh, minister who's sitting in her house, and she's just reading a book. And one of the parishioners knocks on the door, right? She opens the door, and he's a big guy, and he's sweating. It's obviously he's run all the way to the house. He's in tears. And he says to the woman, listen, there's a family lived just down the road. Um, The guy lost his job in the recession. She's looking after three kids. You know, their mother stays with them. Um, But they don't have enough money for the rent. They've got no money at the moment. You know, and their landlord, the landlord's going to kick them out of the house. Even though they're only one day late, as soon as they get late, he's just going to kick them out on the street. And it's the middle of winter. We've got to do something. Please, let's do something, right? So the minister says, yes. We'll go and we'll get some money. And then just in passing, she says, oh, how do you know them? He goes, oh, I'm the landlord, right? Like, the, that's the ironic gesture, right? We, we, we are absolutely concerned. Oh, we've got to do something. And then actually, it's your social, what you're doing, that's creating the problem in the first place. And yet, your concern, you know, it masks that. Now, the reason why the, the anecdote works is because the guy doesn't feel it as a problem. Now, of course there are landlords who feel guilty. Oh, I need to make the money, I, I want to look after them. But this landlord doesn't feel the irony, right? The irony literally means doing an action which one disavows. So if you go to a 70s disco, you dress in the 70s clothes, you dance to the 70s music while slagging off or disavowing, you don't know slagging, do you? While, um, while what's the word for slagging? Dissing. Dissing, there you go. While, while dissing the, the, the music and dissing the clothes that you're wearing. Okay? So you actually engage in the very activity that you're disavowing. How many of us sit in Starbucks and talk about the evils of corporations? How many of us, um, <laughs> you know, drive fuel consuming cars while, while listening to radio programs about the environment? We engage in this ironic gesture all the time and we don't experience it. This is what Marx meant by the word fetishism. He said, where he says, you, you know something's not magical, but you treat it as if it is. And what he meant by that, oh, I shouldn't mention Marx. He doesn't go down well. I'm sure he does here. Um, oh, he's you're, fine. Oh, that's cool. He's fine. Well, what he said is this. He says, um, he says, you know, we can all talk. If we talk, we can all talk about how having a bigger car won't be good for our soul or the environment. You know, uh, having a bigger house isn't going to make us happier. Having lots of money won't satisfy a longing in our hearts. What's the problem? As soon as we walk away from the conversation, we act as if having a bigger car and a better car is better for our soul and the environment. We act as if having a bigger house will make us happier. We act as if having more money will satisfy the longing in our soul. And convincing you is not the problem. 
You have to convince the social self. This is, this is captured beautifully in the story of a guy who um, he thinks he's seed. He literally thinks he's pieces of seed on the ground, right? And he goes to an analyst, and after three years of analysis, finally he goes, hold on, I'm not seed on the ground, I'm a human being, right? So he's really happy, a lot of analysis, a lot of money, but he's really happy, I'm a human being. He goes away, and three weeks later, he's back at the analyst's door, knocking at the door frantically. The guy opens the door, man's sweating, he obviously hasn't eaten for days, looks like he hasn't slept in weeks. The analyst goes, what's wrong? And the guy goes, my next door neighbor's got chickens. He says, why, what's the problem with that? He says, I'm terrified they're gonna eat me. And the analyst goes, but, but you know you're not seed, you know you're a human being. And he goes, I know I'm a human being, but do the chickens know, right? <laughs> now, the, yeah, uh, the problem with preaching is we're trying to convince me that I'm a human being. I know I'm a human being. We have to convince the chickens. Preaching should be convincing the chickens, not me. In other words, I know I should be nicer to the poor. I know I should be more loving to my parents. I know I should be doing more good in my life. You don't need to tell me that. You need to convince the chickens. You need to convince, and what, is, well, what are the chickens? What are the chickens? Do you want to ask that? Peter. Oh, sorry. Yeah. What are the chickens? <laughs> I'm glad you asked that question. Um, the chickens are, uh, uh, you know, like it's like fashion. You go like, I know fashion's shallow. I know, I know that. You don't need to convince me. You need to convince the advertisers. You, need to, you don't need to convince me that having a bigger car won't make me happy. You need to convince the, the magazines that I read. In other words, what we do, um, basically, and I might talk about this more depth tomorrow, is that we... Um, we, we disavow our beliefs. We place them somewhere else. So I, I go fashion shallow, absolutely fashion shallow, but because of the magazines I read, um, I actually, in my embedded actions, I continue to affirm the fashion's not shallow, I engage in irony. And for me, preaching, this is what transformance art is. Transformance art is trying to convince, not you, it's to convince the chickens. Um, it's to convince the, your deeper self, your, what's called your social self. The what you do, right? Here, right, Batman's a perfect example. Okay, right, look at Batman. Okay, what does he do at night? He puts on this crazy rubber suit and he goes out and he beats up criminals, right? Then, after he's beaten up the criminals, he gets into a suit the next day, you know, and he goes and he works in Wayne Industries, okay? Now, as Bruce Wayne, now, what's really interesting is, right, he's doing this big stuff on, the, on Saturday night, you know, beating up on the bad guys, trying to make Gotham City a better place. And yet during the day, he's working in an industry which makes so much money that he can fund a high-tech military campaign and nobody even notices. How much money is Wayne Industries making? Wayne Industry is making phenomenal amounts of money. And one has to ask, is it not industries like Wayne Industries who are, who are making such vast amounts of money without any social regard? Is that not the reason why there are criminals that he has to beat up? Has he not made the connection that the very thing he's doing on Monday to Friday is the very thing he's fighting on Saturday night? Okay, now, this is really important, right? Um, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we think that the site of resistance, he thinks the site of resistance is going out and beating up criminals, but he doesn't realize that what he's doing in his grounded daily activity is creating and generating the very conditions that means he has to do that. Um, and, oh, there's loads of things we can say. What happens is the very thing he thinks is the site of resistance is the very thing he has to do in order to feel good about himself so he can get the suit on and go into work the next day. Um, now, take the Matrix, for example. The Matrix is another beautiful example of this. The first Matrix film, all these Christians watched it and thought, oh, this is like Christianity. Neo is like the Messiah. The, the guys, you know, Zion is like you know, heaven and you know, the revolutionary fighters and all that's great. But what do we find out? Well, as the series goes on, we find out that actually the machines allow Neo to exist. In fact, the machines, Neo's just the latest in the long line of messiahs. And actually, the freedom fighters, they, the, the machines all let them do their thing. And the machines build Zion, or at least let Zion exist. And so what you find out is the very place that you thought was the site of resistance in the first film, you realize is the very thing that the system requires in order to continue to run smoothly. 
very, now that's why the second and third films work, even though they're kind of rubbish, right? It kind of works theoretically. Um, uh, what we, what we think is, we think what we're doing on a Sunday morning is a site of resistance, or on a Tuesday night at our prayer meetings, or, work, or working for the poor on a Thursday evening. That's the site of resistance. That's the site in which we are kind of expressing the kingdom of God. Well, what if that's the very thing that the world needs in order to continue to allow us to run smoothly? We need our little air vent. It's like in work, you slag off your boss, you know, behind your closed doors. You think that's a bad thing? No. That's the very air vent that allows you, as long as you turn up at nine o'clock in the morning and work till five, that boss doesn't care if you slag him off. You still care, you're still there, you're still working away. And so the very site that you think is a site of resistance, the slagging off of your boss, is the very thing that your boss needs to keep you a nice, good citizen. That's why we're all allowed to go a little bit over the speed limit. Because you don't only oppress people too much, you need to create air valves little places, and so the air valves actually prevent us from having real change. The role of the, we, the, the church should be insurrectionary, right? We are about radical change. That's what conversion means. That's what conversion's about. Not convincing the mind, about reconfiguring the entire social self, becoming the actual site of resistance. You know, um, insurre- the difference between a revolution and an insurrection. Do you want to ask me a question? What's the difference between revolution and insurrection? Right. Um, the, 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 a, a revolution changes the whole landscape. It transforms a theological revolution. You know, Jesus was a revolution, transformed and changed the whole structure of economic uh, sacrificial existence and completely, uh, radically ruptured what was going on. Um, an insurrection is different. An insurrection is, is try, you know, so we want a theological revolution. We want to see transformation and change in our society. We want to see not change within the structure. We want to see the, church, the structure itself change. Now, what does that mean? That means that, and I was at a church recently, and they gave this a lot of money to the poor, and I thought that was great. But they did a whole series on the poor, and I asked somebody at the end, you know, what was the content? And here's the interesting thing. Full of incredibly generous people who were giving to the poor. But it, you imagine slavery. Imagine there were, there were people, and um, there's a very famous preacher actually who said, you know, we need to be kind to slaves. We need to be care for them. We need to treat slaves right. We need to use their first name. We need to do all of that. I don't know. We have to ask why there were slaves in the first place. We don't change within the system. The entire system itself needs to change. In the same way, it's all very good giving money to the poor. But we also have to ask, why are there the poor? Why are they there? How can we actually change the structure so that, so, that, so that something really fundamentally changes? So that's what's called substantial change. An insurrection lives that change right here, right now, in these little moments going, you know, the revolution hasn't quite come yet, but we are going to have a little community where we live that change, where we treat each other in the way that we one day hope the world will treat each other, that we will live in this space and we will have a little scent aroma of the kingdom. That's an insurrectionary moment. And if we have enough of those little insurrections, then maybe we can change things. That, they're also called pirate islands. Pirate islands where uh, groups of people used to try to live outside of the system, the structural system of oppression, and they created these pirate islands where they tried to, but of course they're always crushed or they always get annexed in. Flash mobs, you know flash mobs where 300 people turn up in an underground station and dance to iPods and then disappear off. You know, or one was done in the, in the underground in London where everyone arrived with like no trousers on. And then they went about three stops down and then outside there were all these people saying, free trousers, free trousers and all this. And so this kind of happens and then it's gone before it can, you know, what happened? Before it can be colonized by the powers. That's a flash mob. The church's flash mob as creating these little moments of, whoa, you walk in and suddenly you're in this place of real change where you see something of what we want the world to look like, knowing that probably that ain't going to happen for a while, but we live it right here, right now. Will you say, you may, we're all kind of, <sighs> yeah, yeah. okay, yeah. Um, you talk about the, uh, sort of the cognitive self, the ways in which we affirm certain things. Mm-hmm. I know that my identity does not come from how much money I make, how, whatever I, physical yep. appearance, wealth, etc., and yet I live from an, another place. Yes, another place. And then yeah. I think of the um, splankton in Greek, the, the, the bowels, as, the, as a good Jew would speak of. There's yes. the this, this center from which you actually live. Yes. And then there is all the stuff you affirm. Yes. I know that's wrong, that's right, that's true, that's not. Yes. And then I actually, and, and you are saying the, the sermon mm-hmm. 
is about getting to that. Yes, yes, affecting and, this. And essentially, what I hear you saying is, until there's a disruption here, yeah. until this has been almost violently rocked, yeah. it's just, we can continue to just keep this thing going yes. until this says, nope, this whole thing's not working again. Something has happened at this level yes. in which all of reality um, has changed. Absolutely. Ta how does rhetoric, or how does the, whether it's transformance art, they have an experience, or whether they, he yeah. is it possible to hear something that does that? Yes, um, it's, it's very difficult. How does it, how does it look? Um, uh, uh, yeah, that, that, diff, that distinction is, is very, very key. I mean, you see it, that, this is why, what's, it's what's called belief through the other. Often people believe through the minister. Um, and you notice, see uh, a, a musician, if you go to hear a musician, they sing very emotional music, and you don't cry. Why? Because they cry on your behalf, right? So you're sitting there listening to a band, and you might cry sometimes, but often they cry for you. That's why, you know, mourners, professional mourners at funerals, they cry on your behalf. And, and uh, uh, that's why canned laughter, Slavio Shizek talks about how canned laughter doesn't tell you when to laugh. Canned laughter laughs so you don't have to. So, it la so you watch a program, it laughs on your behalf, and then you don't really actually have to laugh yourself, you know? And like, that's what happens in the church, where, you know, as long as Rob believes, I don't have to take the belief too seriously myself. I notice this all the time. This was a fundamental problem I noticed with my first book. Um, that's why I kind of, I'm trying to overcome that, is I notice a lot of people said, um, oh yeah, I affirm doubt, complexity, and ambiguity. I, I affirm that, you know, this unknowing. I affirm all of that. And then I watched what they did. And when they came into church, they, they sang all the songs where Jesus is my boyfriend. All of the sermons were like, all like totally like secure and, and abs, you know, the, the, we know the truth. All the liturgies and the prayers were absolute. And I go, you're lying to me. You say you affirm doubt, but actually the structure is believing on your behalf. Just like the, the can't laugh or laughs on your behalf. The structure believes so you don't really have to. That's why there's, you know, if, if the pastor gets up and says, I have doubts and uncertainties, it can rupture a church. Because it's not everyone can have doubts and uncertainties as long as the structure itself doesn't. And that's what I mean by, by the mm. way, uh, the chicken. We need to convince the chicken. We need to convince the structure itself to change. But that wasn't what you're asking me. Conversion. Um, that's what conversion is, by the way, the substantive radical change. And conversion, we call it rebirth in Christianity. You don't experience birth. You don't experience it. Birth is what opens you up to experience, right? Now, this is why we have to understand what religious experience is. Religious experience at its purest is not an experience at all. Before God shows up, it's not like I have 100 objects in my world, and then God shows up and I have 101 objects in my world. God is that which transforms how I interact with all objects in this world. You know, I don't see the light in this room. Say, will you say that again, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, God is not an object in the world. God is that which transforms how I interact with all objects in this world. And what mm. that means is, oh, I've got a clap, that's the first, hey. You know, <laughs> um, well, well, if you want claps, we can get you claps. You can get claps, okay. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> You'll never get me off. Um, uh, so, uh, now, now that's put me off, that's the first. Um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, so in other words, I, I don't see the light in this room. It's the light that allows me to see. Okay, I don't experience my life. It's my life that allows me to experience. As soon as I try to reflect on my life, yeah. I either become a Cartesian dualist where I have a mind body, a, a mind somewhere in my body, and I've got the problem of where is that? And how does it interact with my yeah. body? Or I become a behaviorist and I say, consciousness is just an epiphenomenon of my uh, kind of neurological, biological processes. In other words, as soon as I reflect on my life, I kind of lose it. But I can't deny that I lose my life, that, that, I, that I live my life. I can't deny that I am immersed in my life. In the same way as God, it's like, it's God's transcendence is not the opposite to God's imminent. God is so imminent, like my life, that God is transcendent, that I can't grasp mm. God. Mm. Hence, you know that statement, God, G-O-D-I-S-N-O-W-H-E-R-E, -E, which can be read, God is nowhere or God is now here, depending on which way you look at it. That's kind of like, as soon as God is now here, as soon as you grasp God as an object in the world, God is nowhere. You've mm. lost God. Mm. But as soon as God is nowhere and you simply be and open yourself up, God is now here. And so how do we do it in, this, in the sermon? I'll, you know, I'm mm. taking up a lot of time here. Uh, well, how do we do it? Well, one of the ways, by the way, you have, to offend nobody in Icon, we try to offend everybody. We're an equal, equal offense community. Um, you know, somebody will come up to me and say, you know, no, you really offended me by what you were saying. Oh, I go like, listen, 
it's worse for me, I offend me. And, you know, and you can walk away. You don't have to live with me. Every, I am, I am where, everywhere I go, I'm there, you know. I have to listen to this rubbish all the time. You know, give me a break, you know. So, like, and the point is, I want to offend myself cause a rupture in myself. So what we say is, we are, whatever you believe in icon, be open to being wrong. That's the first thing. You create an atmosphere where people are open. Now, the second thing we create, and this is very key as a preliminary, is what we call suspended space. And suspended space is where we try to live the neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. Now, we expand it out, neither freedom fighter nor terrorist, neither American nor Iraqi, neither Fox nor CNN, neither a hawk nor dove, neither, neither this nor that. You can't really forget if you're a man or a woman. You can't really forget if you're rich or poor. But what we say is the church is a space where we engage in what in theology is called kenosis, in the same way that God emptied himself, came nothing. Mm. Mm. So we engage in that process of emptying ourselves, becoming nothing. We symbolically enter the space where we say, I am leaving this stuff at the door. Now, you'd never take your shoes off in the menagerie bar, right? You'd catch something. But you, in some sense, give, divest yourself of your various positionings. Instead of saying, I'm both an American and a Christian, you say, no, there is something about being a Christian in which I divest myself of those identities. And we enter into the space where we encounter each other um, beyond the color of each other's eyes. Emmanuel Levin asked, beautifully said, if you see the color of someone's eyes, you are not relating to them. Which is a great thing to say to a girl if you forget the color of their eyes, right? But it's, um, <laughs> it's, what does he mean by that? But well, he means that if I'm not really listening to you, I'll see what your color of your eyes are. I'll see what you're wearing. I have an eye at relationship with you. I see you as an object. But if we get into a really good conversation, even though I'm looking directly at your eyes, I don't notice the color anymore. I don't notice what you're wearing, what you look like. We've entered into an eye-thou encounter. And in the church, in that canonic self-emptying space, we encounter each other briefly beyond the color of each other's eyes. Not because it's not important, our identities and our politics. It's very important what you vote for and how you vote. But the church, I'm not going to tell you. I mean, my role in ICON is to make sure that no one colonizes the space, including myself, right? That I'm not allowed to give my, you know. But you, so we, we have the arguments. We fight outside, but we come in and we encounter each other beyond the color of each other's eyes so that when we do fight, we fight not as enemies, we fight as friends. Mm. You know, we fight and we wrestle through these issues as friends and not enemies. So you create that suspended space. And then, um, um, uh, yeah, and then, there's the, then how do you rupture? And I'm, I'll talk about that tomorrow. I should probably talk about it tomorrow. But ultimately, it's parables. Your preaching is not primarily descriptive. Your, your preaching should primarily be performative. Right? Your preaching shouldn't be primarily descriptive. I trying to convince this. It's primarily performative. It should do something. That's parables. That's why I love parables so much. Because parables try to get beyond just the head and rupture something in the heart. You know, a parable catches you off guard. Um, and it's, right, here's, here's a parable, for example, um, which, which expresses what I'm thinking. You know, in the church, we often think belief is most important. What you believe is of primary importance. If I meet you in the street, I will tell you, do you believe Jesus died for your sins? You can be reconciled to God. If you believe that, then what comes next? Um, behavior. You pray and you repent. And then what happens next? Third, belonging. You enter into the religious community. Now, for Pascal or the Jewish community, it, it, that's completely you know, messed up. It's like a, you, a, a child starts by belonging in the aftermath of a birth, right? Belonging. And then as the child grows, they engage in behavior. They eat at the same time as their parents. They, they you know, go for walks at the same time. And then belief comes last. And at first, it's completely what the parents believe. And then, you know, it's diametrically opposed in adolescence. You know? I mean, what's the worst thing to have in adolescence? You know, it's parents who let you do anything. How can, how can you write rock music if your parents will give you everything you want, you know? Um, you, need, you need to fight. You need to be able to push yourself back. The most oppressive thing in, 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 if you're an adolescent is nice parents. Uh, awful. That's, horrible. That's such a nasty thing to give to your kids. That's awful. Um, now, and, then, and then finally, it's terrible. And then finally, you kind of find some equilibrium. And, uh, you know, this is beautifully expressed in a very ancient Jewish parable, which says the two rabbis were arguing about a verse in the Torah. They were arguing about what it meant. And they couldn't come to an agreement after 20 years of arguing. 
So God gets so annoyed by this <laughs> that God parts the clouds, comes down and says to them, I have listened to you two rabbis argue for 20 years over what this means. I'll tell you what it means. And in a rare moment of unity, the two rabbis turn to God and say, what right have you to come down here from heaven and tell us what it means? You go back there and let us argue about it, right? Now, that's, that's completely different from how I grew up. Do you want to say something? No. no. Okay. The, sorry. Uh, that's completely different from, I got a lot of energy. Um, I, I, I grew up where I wanted to know what God said. I wanted to know the answer. And this is kind of going, no, the last thing you want is, is God coming in and telling you what it's about. Why? Well, because it's not about intellectually getting the right answer. The text is like a wonderful piece of art. You go into an art museum, you know, are you obsessed with going, what's the right interpretation of the art? No, the art doesn't have a singular interpretation, not because it lacks meaning, but because it has so much meaning. It's just too much to grasp. That's why you have to return to your favorite pieces of art again and again and again. You can't just look once, because it speaks in new ways. And the point is, are you transformed by your interaction with the artwork? Are you drawn into it? Are you in this engagement with it? And that's, that's, so that's what your preaching should be doing. It should be drawing people into a conversation, a transformative conversation. It should be not giving them the singular answer, but blowing up all the people's expectations where they're having to think for themselves. Be angry with what you're saying, you know? Sometimes, I've done, we do this in Icon sometimes, we give completely uh, wrong things that I don't believe, kind of we've played around with saying them, um, just to kind of create ruptures. Yeah. Or, uh, well, there's loads of times we've done that. I should tell you about some of them. But um, uh, someday. But uh, yeah, you know, that's what preaching's about. And so you come out, not, it's not giving water to those who are thirsty. It's giving salt and making people thirsty, getting people to be thirsty. It's, it's that. Um, it's, you talked about this, um, a, a, the aroma versus being the bread. Mm -hmm. Can you talk, uh, creating essentially a hunger Yes. Uh, you, I've heard you talk about this. Will you say yes. more about that? Because you're touching on it here. Absolutely. And, and this touches on something you were saying earlier, which I thought was brilliant. I mean, you, we, we, think, we think that, you know, you, you know, traditionally, oh, you have a need for God, and then God satisfies the need, right? And so what we're doing is we're kind of exposing the need. But it's funny. I mean, there's, a, there's no story I love about uh, two guys going down the street to the pub, right? They're going to Finders or whatever. And uh, they're walking down, and there's this, uh, you know, Baptist church, and it has a sign that says, convert to Christianity and get $200, right? And I go, brilliant, brilliant, because I don't have much money. It's going, like, okay, you go in, do the whole conversion thing, right? Become a Christian now. Get the $200, and we'll go down to the pub. It's a brilliant idea. So the guy goes in laughing, you know. He's in there for about half an hour, and finally he comes out, $200 in his back pocket, and his mate goes, well, did you get the money? Did you get the money? And his friend just, like, just puts his hand on the guy's shoulder and says, is money all you non-Christians think about? You know? <laughs> like, um, as if... As if, as if, you know, um, you know, that selfish kind of desire for the money could lead to that substantive transformation. There's a great story, can I tell one more and then I'll, I'll explain my point. I love this because in Northern Ireland, we have this story about the police force and they were called the RUC, right? And it's a story about how the RUC got peace money to come over and train with the FBI and the CIA in America, okay? So they get on the plane, 12 of their finest, fly over, they land, and it's one of these like team building things. So they get off and, and they're brought to this forest and the guy goes, okay, you've got to go into the forest and you've got to retrieve a rabbit. Fair enough. So the FBI go first, they fire in, they're in there for about 20 minutes and then you hear a single gunshot ring through the air and they come out, rabbit dead, bullet through the center of the head, perfect shot, well done, well done, well done. Yeah. Next is the CIA, so they're all sunglasses and, you know, us and go in, quiet, nothing, don't hear a sound. You almost don't even know you're, they're there, you know, they're all, it's like they're invisible even when they're there. So they're in there for about an hour, and then you hear a single twig snap, and they come out with the rabbit, it's dead, not a mark on its body, they just find it like that, right? You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it was just lying there. You know? um, so, yes. Um, so then, it's the, then the story goes, it's the RUC's turn, so they get their flat jackets on, they get their plastic bullet rounds, right, and they fire in there, and they're in there for ages, and eventually they come out, and uh, the biggest guy, the biggest guy is dragging a bear behind him, <laughs> yes. smile, big smile on his face, you know, and the guy goes, uh, he says, first of all, he says, you were in there for three weeks, right, and he says, <laughs> and secondly, that's not a rabbit, that's a bear. So the big RUC man just smiles, looks the bear into the eyes, and the bear starts to shake and goes, I'm a rabbit, I'm a rabbit. <laughs> yeah. and it's, it's, 
tells you something about the RUC, right, and their tactics. Um, but, you know, as if someone's fear, you know, can drive, can have a radical conversion. See if someone is seeking um, God because they're seeking eternal life. They're not seeking God, they're seeking eternal life. See if someone's seeking God because they're seeking meaning. They're not seeking God, they're seeking meaning. Right? Like, think about it like this. See if, I, if I'm single. Um, anybody want to? Uh, and I, and, um, and uh, I, 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 I'm... Oh, no, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm looking for somebody, right? I want anybody, and everybody keeps away from you. That whole thing of, you know, you're desperate, so no, you can't find anybody. Whenever you need, because the person knows you don't need them. You need them to fulfill a certain need. You know, whether you want someone to make you feel good, you need, want someone to go to the cinema with, you want someone to fulfill a need, so everyone keeps away. Then, ironically, you get to the point where maybe you go, actually, I don't need to go out with anybody. I'm totally satisfied in who I am. Then ironically, of course, that's the time when you meet someone, or at least that's the time when you're more likely to meet somebody. At the very point when you do not need them is the point when you're more likely to meet. So this is why I say I do anti-evangelism. If people need God, I always kind of put them off, right? I, go, I get them to the point where they don't need God at all, because that's the best place to meet God. Because then when the person arrives that you love, right? You're in a bar, you don't need anybody, you've taken up your artwork and all of that, and then you meet somebody, <laughs> and, and you really fall for them. What, what is the romantic truth? The romantic truth, of course, is I never needed you until I met you. And now that I met you, I realize that I've always needed you. Right? In mm-hmm. other words, the, the need is retroactively given. Um, so mm-hmm. that's, why, that's why people who've just had a kid are the most annoying people in the world, right? Because they, they're kind of almost like, oh, you know, I've just had this child. Oh, you're not complete until you've had a child. Oh, I've waited for this. You know, I've been incomplete until my child arrived. Now, the point is, it's true, but it's also false. It's true because the child's birth retroactively creates the need for the child. So you retroactively say, I was incomplete. So in other words, you're complete and you're hanging around, you're doing your thing, and then when the child is born, you go, I never knew I needed you until I met you, and now I realized I've always needed you. Mm. Um, And so as I kind of, you know, anti-evangelism, get people to the point where they don't need God, and then provide a space where where they can actually engage in in, in something wonderful. I'm not sure if that answered your question. I'm not sure what your question was. I just, I just answer whatever I want. If you, if you keep going, I'll forget it. It's, oh, oh yeah. I, um, it definitely was connected. This idea that you, you aren't the bread. Oh, yes. I am, yes. I am not Jesus. Yes. I am not the bread of life. Yes. But there is a chance I may help create some space where all of a sudden you will take a whiff of an aroma and you didn't come in hungry, but all of a sudden now you have realized that you're hungry. Absolutely, and, and that's why I was saying, exactly that's why I was saying this point, because what, what I want to do is I want to get people to the point where they're not, they're not needing God, they're not looking for eternal life, they're not looking for this, that, and get them confident in themselves. Right? See, if someone, see if someone's in pain, the last thing they want, they may think, I need God. No, they need, as what something you said earlier, they need to hear, they need someone to talk to. There's a beautiful parable of, of this woman whose child dies. She's only a few weeks old, a child dies, mm-hmm. and she is so distraught that she straps the child to her body, and she goes in search of someone who can resuscitate her. And she goes to holy men, she goes to uh, magicians, she goes to doctors, and no one can help. And finally, someone says, well, way high up in the mountains, there is a saint. And the saint is supposed to be so close to God that, that he doesn't even need to eat. God provides food for him. So she goes up, and she eventually finds the saint. She sits and she tells him about her suffering. And after a few moments, the saint says, I can help you. But first, first you need to bring me a handful of mustard seeds from the home of someone who hasn't suffered death and pain. And when you bring me those mustard seeds, then, then I shall cure you. So the woman goes in search of a house um, that has not had that dark mm. sun, that darkness of suffering, and she can't find any house. Wherever she goes, she just hears the stories that other people have. But of course, as she hears the stories of other people's suffering, she gradually comes to terms with her own until finally she is able to bury her infant in the soil of the world. Whenever someone is suffering, what they need is they need someone who will listen, someone who, will, uh, who they can testify to, someone to triangulate, someone who will listen to that pain. And then, then whenever they're healed and they're well, then it, the very aroma of you doing that, the very aroma of you simply being God in the world to them will draw them to a place where they can, in a healthy way, 
begin to explore the bread of life. So it's about actually getting rid of the false needs and the false desires, just being God in the world that opens up people to actually enter into something truly dynamic. That's for me as being the aroma of Christ. It's actually not talking about Jesus at all sometimes. That's why the anarchist community drew a big outside the menagerie bar, drew a circle with God in it and a stroke through it. I was going, we love it. We go, these guys really understand what icons all about. These guys like, they just, I mean, honestly, they just have it down to a T. So it's our first, it was our first icon, icon's first icon. You, when you walk into the menagerie, you see this no God sign where you walk in and we go, Deus es that God is the one who gives God. Augustine, no one gives God but God. I'm not going to give God. That's what I used to do. The, the second half of my life is repentance over the first half. Um, so, you know, Deus es that God is the one who gives God. I don't give God. We create this space where in one sense God is refused entry, as in I'm not giving God, and we create that open suspended space where we lay down, where we engage in the canonic self-emptying. Oh, by the way, I love in Christianity that we try to be like God. We want to be transformed more into the image of God, right? And what does that look like? Well, God became human. So, to be, so we want to, to model ourselves on God. Well, what's the perfect way of doing that? Well, in the central idea of the incarnation, to become more fully human, mm. you know, because that's what our God did. Mm. Um, that's kind of the aroma stuff. Um, hey, yeah, that, that was great. Hey, yeah, that was great. <laughs> uh, I have like a thousand, thousand questions. Um, I have an observation. I would imagine if we were to survey everybody here and say, give us your top, what would be your top three most significant, whatever. My experience has been over the years talking to people about milestones or major moments in their life where the divine, they encountered the divine. Yeah. Like, okay, yeah. what were moments in which you thought, okay, this is, this is something other than everything else. This is more. Yes. This is. What's fascinating to me is how many times when you say to people, give me your top three, top four, top five, how many of them are completely outside of explicitly religious contexts? Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's, oh, I was in a church service, but oftentimes it was in a place in which they had um, disabandoned any sort of notion that this is going to be some sort of Jesus experience. Yeah. So, correct? It's like I was in this place, it was in nature, it was at this place where they had given up all expectations or had no expectations and that was where they had their moments. Say, say how do you see that? Because yeah. you touched on that again and again. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because we, we, we are, have churches and settings where it's like come to this setting and meet God, find Jesus here, great things, but the reality is how many times we stumble in yeah, absolutely. To, to the resu to yeah. divinity, the resurrection, etc., all these other places. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I mean, when I, when I did that in verse, you know, neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, I mentioned a few other ones, but I mean, one of them is neither Christian nor non-Christian. I mean, the, the Christian position is the, is, the, is the laying down of Christianity. That's, that's the, the ironic thing is we're, we're, we're uh, Christianity is a religion that critiques religion. I was in, this, in Geneva, and they had the, the Church of St. Peter where you know, Calvin preached and the sign of the institution. You know, this is, this is the institution of church. And then at the other end, they had Jer a statue of Jeremiah done by a student of Rodan, turning in shame and disgust from the church. Right? I go, which way do I go? Do I embrace the institution? Do I embrace Jeremiah? There's something wonderful about Christianity. It's, a, it's an institution which critiques itself as an institution. It says the prayer is wonderful, but the prayer is not enough. The, 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 the rituals are great, but they can get in the way. It's like, you know, that the, the, the priest, who, the old priest who would go into the temple every night to pray, and the, the wildest like, cats would always annoy him, so he tied the cat to a tree in order to be able to pray. And he was an old man, so eventually he died, and the disciples continued to tie the cat to the tree every night during prayers. So eventually the cat dies, you know, um, so they purchase a new cat to tie to the tree during <laughs> prayer time. Now, <laughs> After seven generations of cats, the tree falls down. So they plant a new tree to tie the seventh generation of cats to during prayer time. And then finally, the theologians come along and they write learned treaties about the significance of tying cats to trees during prayer. You know, this, is, this is what kind of happens to these things that are supposed to be life-giving. So yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm over. The next icon gathering is called pyrotheology. Um, and we, we what took- kind of, What kind of theology? It's pyrotheology. Pyro, as in fire, pyro theology. Oh, love yeah. it. Oh, was brilliant. Because we took this, a quote from Doretti, Bonaventura Doretti, um, a, a Spanish anarchist. He said, the only church that illuminates is a burning one. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. And we just went, we've got to do an icon on that. And part of it is, um, 
We're gonna, we're doing this festival and we're gonna have like oil cans and with water and we're gonna look as if we're setting fire to the festival. We're just gonna be walking around like this with pyro theology written on it and like suits and all on with somebody with a lighter around at the tents. And whenever, whenever someone's doing a talk and they're saying about the fire exits, somebody's gonna get up and start pouring petrol all over the, uh, the stage while they're, they're talking about the fire exits, you know? So, but we can, I love that because there's, there's obviously the Duretti side, which a church, he wants to get rid of the church. But there's also that sense in the Bible that the church should be in flames. You know, this church should be consumed. And, and actually, there's an irony there of what is the church that, that burns? Should it, in one sense, burn down sometimes? Should it burn with fire? And there's this um, ambiguity. I love the ambiguity of it. And uh, yeah, I don't know why I was saying that. So, um, so I, I was saying that the Christian, non-Christian thing, because yeah, for me, I, you know, I want to create a space, which is, and that's why we meet in a bar, and it's not a closed bar, and it's, it's just we engage in this kind of, this, this, ra- this transformance art to try and say, you know, it's not about, you know, name-checking, you know, Jesus or something every five minutes. It's about trying to create a space where we can encounter one another and have this radical conversion moment. Um, and for me, it's hard for me to say, but yeah, my first one, and this is why I go really, I go down, you wouldn't believe this, I go down quite well in really conservative colleges. I was in Texas, middle, Dallas, Dallas, right? They've got guns in, in Texas, right? Um, <laughs> now, I'm Irish, I can dodge bullets, right? But I'm worried, because I'm going to Dallas Christian College, and I go, oh, it's going to be tough, you know, they're going to tell you, know, and I, and, and it just was such, it was the only place I spoke in that whole tour where they brought me out for lunch afterwards, the students, because they were so enraptured by this mm. stuff. Why? Yeah. Because, because conversion is so, of such central importance to this, to this community, you know, and, and that's what I'm all about. That when I was 17, not involved in a church or anything like that, I had this moment where my substance changed. You know, now this is no, you know, I took drugs, stole cars, and then when I was five, I became a Christian, you know. <laughs> and, and that, but, you know, but, you know, I do, I have to say this, I do go, I was dead, um, and, and then I was alive, and I don't mean that in a religious sense. Um, I understand whenever, you know, the blind guy says, all I know is I was blind, and, and now I can see. I don't know who this Jesus is, you know, I, I don't have the intellectual stuff, all I know is I was blind and now I can see. And that's what I'm all about, of going Christianity promises substantive transformation. And you know, most, you know, if, if we're lucky, some of it might happen in church, you know, I don't know. Oh, yeah. I, know, I know I'm a bit optimistic there, but um, you know, oh, I'm holding out hope. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Were some of you actually taking notes this whole time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th- um, Peter, thank you. You're going to come tomorrow morning. Um, Peter will we'll do another um, hour. And I just, on behalf of all of us, thank you. Thank oh, you so thank much you. for sharing. Uh, yeah. Really, yeah. Hey, cheers, really great. Cheers, man. Thank uh, you. Uh, this is just really, <laughs> I have one. Uh, I was thinking about, you grew up in Belfast. Yeah, born and bred. Um, I was on tour and had a night in Belfast and there were protesters outside of the venue I was speaking at. Yeah, they were. And I'm okay. instantly wondering if they were from Icon. <laughs> yeah, maybe but, that. Uh, yeah. That's just because we don't like you, Bob. They, were passing, of- <laughs> they were passing anti-me flyers out. Oh, wow. And my wife with the kids was in a store and getting something at the cash register and there was a stack of the flyers right there. Wow. And um, she was reading them and... and taking in the content of the flyer, and uh, the cashier figured out that, that she had some sort of connection with this flyer, and said, well, this is Belfast, we protest everything. Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> we are passionate people in Belfast, you know, we'll fight about anything, you know. The only people who don't like the Irish are other Irish, you know, we'll just fight each other. That's good. By the way, can I say one thing about tracks? Yeah, there was a flyer written against me, and I kind of helped make it, it was great. This guy was saying, he says, <laughs> He says, he, says, he says, at the end of a talk, he goes, like, I'm, you know, I'm writing the flyer against you. I was going, brilliant. I said, that's fantastic. Can we chat about it? So we went and had coffee, and then we kind of devised what the title would be. That's a great title. And uh, so it was, I was kind of part of making, I'm very proud of that, part of making the flyer that is now against me. Yeah. <laughs> because, because everything we believe is wrong, including what I believe, you know. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, you have a few things to talk about over lunch. Grace and peace be with you.